Namaste, Dave. Namaste. Namaste, Bhagavan. So you're having a big storm over there. <laughs> yeah. And here I am. We're about to get a blizzard. <laughs> um, you're, you're surfing and I'm snowboarding. <laughs> when I was a kid, we used to have big storms like that. But nobody made a big deal out of it. We just dealt with it. I remember one time we had a really big storm, about four feet of snow. And at that time we had a dog, we had a Samoyed, one of those white dogs in there. They're related to uh, sled dogs, Arctic sled dogs. And we opened the door in the morning. I think it was even Christmas week. And the whole place was just nothing but white snow and absolute silence. That dog shot out of that door so fast <laughs> and would not come in all day. <laughs> he loved the snow. Wow. Yeah, what a great dog. Anyway. Yeah, everybody's uh, scared of nature now. Isn't once it that rains funny? a little bit too much or once it snows. Yeah. And now we have like so much more shame. technology and everything. Yeah, it interesting is. that you brought that up because that that's uh -huh. something that um I was actually gonna gonna start with <laughs> is okay. um is technology hindering spirituality currently? Yes, I think so. There's a good reason why people in the ancient days didn't do a whole lot to develop technology. People lived simply close to the earth in an agrarian culture. And they knew about scientific laws. They weren't stupid. They knew about atoms. They knew about electricity. Of course, they were very expert in astronomy and astrology and uh, even medicine. But everything was based on nature. It was simple. There were no or very, very few intermediaries between nature and the average person. The average person had everything they need to get food for themselves, to, to make a living at some uh, natural way of life, you know, like raising crops or raising animals or uh, doing trade, you know, simple trade by horseback or by wagon, ox cart, you know, land and cows were considered wealth. There was really no money except maybe among kings to settle debts between kingdoms and that would be in gold. So this whole business of money and finance is simply, simply to enable a class of middlemen to come up and disintermediate everybody and get between them and nature and take away the means of production from the average person and make them completely dependent on industry and finance. That's what it's all about. Mm. So, yeah, that gets in the way. Whoa, boy. Yeah, um, it begs to ask the question, uh, if traditions are getting farther and farther back in time, and people are gravitating more towards, you know, technology and the woo of AI and innovation. What science has to offer them. <laughs> yeah. Um, how is spirituality and its customs like going to survive? And not really in the lens of like religion, but more so with the non-duality concepts. Well, it's becoming more and more obscured by all the noise. I mean, it's, it's enough to have to deal with Maya. Now we've got Maya within Maya. <laughs> yeah, a dream within a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Like more layers of covering, Upadi. So to get anywhere near the truth, you have to get all that stuff off. 
that's why it's very difficult. What we're trying to do with NOLI is really kind of difficult because we're trying to start at the top with the knowledge of consciousness. And traditionally in the old days, that was the last thing you would study after you had all the prerequisites. But in this day and time, there's no time for the prerequisites and there's no facility. Everyone has become like alienated from nature and poverty stricken, even in advanced countries. So, uh, you know, they need something that's direct, that doesn't require any facility, any travel or anything like that. That's the study of consciousness, because you can do it sitting in a corner of your room. <laughs> you know, you don't need any equipment or paraphernalia or to travel anywhere. All you need is the information and to do the work. Is this, um, so how is the study of consciousness in Noli different from, let's just say, the philosophical point on consciousness or the psychological viewpoint of consciousness or the, the scientific you know, viewpoint of it? It's very different because we study consciousness directly, not in terms of some other thing. See, like philosophy or science, which is a form of philosophy uh, or religion, all study consciousness within the context of something external. But we're saying you should study con consciousness directly by observing yourself without any intermediary, without any symbolic content, like a child. A child has an open mind, an unconditioned consciousness. They're not thinking in terms of some symbolic arrangement of thoughts like religion or philosophy or science. They're only looking at what is. And I think if you started to educate a child at a young age about consciousness, like they would get it immediately, you know? There's nothing in the how, way. How, how would you go about to, like how is a practical way of, because society is just gonna get more complex and it's just gonna get more difficult to, you know, um, weave throughout the noise and, and get to that, that piece. So how does somebody go about practically teaching the young Th these concepts, because that's going to be, you know, the future anyways. We don't have access to the young. The young are, you know, taken into the uh, school system. We have access to adults. As soon as you try to uh, get involved with kids, there's all kinds of stuff that kicks in uh, to prevent you. Because the kids are viewed as food for the system and the system mm. is, is is violently opposed to messing with their food supply <laughs> so pr that's not a practical option in today's world today we have to deal with the adults people who have enough uh, knowledge and, and wisdom to seek out some solution to the problems of suffering who have experience and they know the world is suffering. Yeah. I think um, it's, it's really prevalent. I mean, uh, a lot of these questions are coming from like the Western New York point of view um, because that's, that's where I've lived all my life. Um, and it seems like a lot of people definitely are uncomfortable in their living situations. But spirituality doesn't seem like something that's going to work for them because it doesn't seem tangible so the question in that is like where is spirituality that somebody can ex experience or realize like in their daily in their daily lives like what what is something that can shed a light on how spirituality is everywhere well like ramana used to ask people are you conscious are you <laughs> conscious of being conscious 
If the answer is yes, <laughs> then you're enlightened. And you can let go of the conditioned consciousness and embrace the unconditioned. See, that's a one-step process. If you're ready for that, if you're prepared, if you have the, um, the insight and the ability, you can do that, okay? That's what Zen tries to do. I think Zen is one of the most beautiful paths because it tries to set up a situation, not teach a doctrine or a dogma, but create a situation where you are stripped of your symbolic layer of interpretation of reality and forced to confront existence and consciousness directly. But again, there are uh, social boundaries in the way of that. For example, the discipline that's required in Zen can't be implemented in modern society because people can so easily just pick up and leave or click to the next video or whatever. So uh, this is an open question and it's something I've been working on for a long time. Um, I wish I knew the answer. I wish I could say, yeah, one, two, three, you know, but I don't. <laughs> you know, how do we get people, how do we like get them to set aside all their conditioning, even for a few minutes and look at this alternate way of being and seeing things? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the million dollar question right there. This uh, makes me think about something that you said in a previous conversation that was really intriguing um, that maybe you could explain more into how all the impressions that come into the waking state and dreaming state kind of condition the Sushupti consciousness. Yes, they do. Right. So whatever open, unresolved issues or tensions that we are holding, either in waking or dream, when we go into the sushupti state, the deep sleep state, these become intentions. And because sushupti is not the effect of anything, that's why when we go into deep sleep, we don't perceive anything. Because sushupti is never the effect. It's only a cause. So any intention that we have when we're in sushupti is very, very powerful and can condition the other states of consciousness, you know, in really unlimited ways, it, up to and including the formation of a new body and a new world, because they, they come together. The ego and the world are created together. They exist together. They, they need each other to exist. So there's no such thing as creating a body without also creating a world or an world. environment in which the body comes, comes into and takes birth. Is that the same, like, let's say I was in high school and I had a really tough test that I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to fail. And I go to sleep with anxiety and then I wake up also in a panic, like, oh my God, or my heart's racing because I know the test is coming. Is that like a light form of how the impression of whatever I think I'm gonna deal with with the future goes into when I'm going to sleep, thus yeah. it like affects when I wake up? See, a, a better approach would be to cram the night before the test <laughs> yeah. and, and go to sleep with all that stuff in your mind, right? And then you would, uh, have it <laughs> ready and fresh in the morning. Yeah, in the morning. I used to do that. <laughs> I thought that was just a procrastination thing, but maybe that could be a smart tool. So um, dealing with Shishupi is the topic that we were talking about. Impressions. So um, you said that it's better to 
actually cram so that you have that information fresh for you the day after. So yeah, because whatever be is realized. whatever is up and up and current in your mind when you go into sushupti is going to create some intentions that are very powerful. When you come out of sushupti, they will manifest. And uh, the easiest way to, to demonstrate that is to think of something specific as you go into sleep. And then you'll find that when you wake up in the morning, you're automatically thinking of that, like mantra or whatever it is, you know, that you use as a test. Mm. So um, on the topic of impressions, so it really does seem like we can engineer our consciousness or like our pathways through this through this process. Absolutely. That's what mantra is all about. Mantra is the deliberate creation of many, many similar impressions. By repeating the mantra over and over, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, or whatever your mantra is you create lots and lots of impressions of that particular thought. And of course, that influences not only now, you know, in, in the immediate time frame, but at the end of life, when your whole life passes before your mind's eye, uh, that influences the quality of the impressions, which determines the level of being in the next life. Because that's that's you're going into sushup, sushupti with everything at the time of death. So what you do every day in your whole life determines the uh, level of being and consciousness that you take with you into sushupti at the time of death, and that means it creates the next body and world. Because remember, they're linked. Yeah. Um, so I think like for some people who don't maybe have a higher power or something outside of time and space that kind of like dies this whole thing, they have trouble connecting the Shushupti state to the next life. Um, I can see exactly what you're talking about because I can see that in my present day life, how all my impressions do create the quality of my being. Um, and this leads to another point that we were having in the conversation about why all the ancient scriptures, like let's just say the Mandukya Upanishad that um, Noli is um, highly uh, based on, um, that why do all the ancients and scriptures come to the conclusion that this is some sort of simulation uh, bent on awareness? It's not exactly a simulation. Because a simulation means like a model of something real that exists someplace else, isn't it? Like that computer game mm -hmm. Sim City or Sim Family or whatever. It's a, a model of a city or a model or like a shoot 'em up games. It's a model of a battle, mm -hmm. right? So th that's a simulation because it's based on something real. But the conditioned consciousness or, or the uh, material manifestation isn't based on anything else. There, there is no real world that involves a, a large manifestation of separate objects. Because as soon as you have that, you have an unreal world. <laughs> See, as soon as things are perceived, they are different from the self. And because the self is the only thing that really exists, all these apparently separate things actually don't exist, but they're like thoughts or dreams. And as soon as your state of mind changes, as soon as your state of consciousness changes, so do the thoughts and dreams. That's why when you go from waking into sleep, for example, the whole world disappears. 
and you find yourself in another world in a different body and with a whole different environment that you that somehow feels right and familiar isn't it mm -hmm. just like when you're awake the world around you seems totally oh yeah this is this is reality right but when you're in dreams the world also feels like that oh yeah this is the reality and i know these people and this is I know what's going to happen even sometimes in dreams. Huh? But then when you come out of the dream, you look back on it and say, oh, no, that was, that was just a dream. Why? Because it's temporary. It's impermanent. It doesn't stay the same. And we think that waking consciousness is real because it does have continuity. It, a lot of, of things about it do stay the same. But if we back off even further, we can see that the so-called waking reality also is impermanent. All the multifarious objects of the world also always change. They come into existence, they stay for some time and they go away. Now that might be a longer time, at least from, from our apparency, from our subjective point of view, might be a longer time than the objects we see in dreams. But the quality is the same. It's they're still impermanent and there's still duality because they're perceived, they're different from the self. The self so, is perceiver, uh, yeah. The Manduki Upanishad, um, it, it goes over ex exactly those points that realness is defined by something that is um, unchanging, eternal, and not um, subject to prior cause and effect. Right. So it, it seems like they, um, the ancients back then, which is like thousands of years ago, um, were trying to find like the fundamental root of reality in a sense, um, how, how do they, where did they make the connection in the subjective reality that then reflected also the objective reality with the same qualities? Good question. Neti neti. Because you, you sit in contemplation and you contemplate the objects of the manifold of the world. And you discern when they come into existence and when they go out of existence. And if they change, neti, that's not it. This is not it. That's what neti means, not this. So you go through all the objects of the world, the body, uh, the house that you stay in, the people around you, various possessions, titles, labels, designations, uh, all of these are subject to change. And then you go into the subtle world and you look at your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> They're changing all the time, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so all of these things are not real. Neti, neti, not this. So you keep going by a process of exclusion. Neti, 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 neti. Until what's left? Nothing. <laughs> no thing. <laughs> no thing. Yeah, because every thing is impermanent. Therefore, the only really permanent thing, the only real, real thing is the self, the perceiver, the seer, the unconditioned awareness, Brahman. In, in this context, does that mean also that the spirit doesn't exist or the spirit changes? 
What do you mean by spirit? What do you mean by spirit? So, um, so we're talking about consciousness, and this is kind of enveloped in spirituality, right? So people have concepts of like a spirit, something that's a metaphysical identity rather than like a physical identity. Uh. So in in that context of like a Jatavada, where only awareness exists, is the spirit like also just like a concept? Yes, it's just a concept because it also can change. I can think I am a, a Christian. I am a Jew, I am a Muslim, I'm a devotee of Krishna, I'm a devotee of Shiva. See, mm -hmm. I'm a disciple of this guru or that guru, and it can change. And it does. We mm -hmm. see it all the time. Mm 